um, the third of our speakers in the 2021-22 Geography Speaker Series. Um, I'm Becky Mansfield and I'm the um, chair of our speakers committee and so I wanted to welcome everybody here today. Um, and before passing things over to Huyen Le for an introduction to our speaker, Ariana Planey, today. Um, I also wanted to um, have everybody note that to mark your calendars for our fourth speaker of this semester, um, May Miller on November 19th. And as she is here at OSU, that will be uh, have the in-person option, which is very exciting. Um, and then, uh, but please do sign up online, um, whether you're going to do Zoom or in person, we want to know who's doing each. Um, and then we also have um, our lineup for spring that will have grad students be presenting in January and February and then pick up in March and April um, with more of our speaker series. So, um, so mark your dates for those talks and the, hopefully those will be in person also. That's the aim. So let me pass it over to Huyen and I will stop share. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Ariana Planey as our colloquium speaker today. Dr. Planey is an assistant professor in the Department, Department of Health Policy and Management in the Skilling School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She is a health medical geographer with expertise in measuring and conceptualizing healthcare access, health and healthcare equity, and spatial epidemiology. Dr. Planey's research and teaching foci include the application of spatial analytic, statistical epidemiologic methods to study interactions between health and healthcare policies, healthcare access, and utilization. She also studies the underlying population level health inequities and identify points of intervention at structural and system levels. Currently, Dr. Blaney is conducting collaborative studies of both outcomes among Black immigrants in segregated neighborhoods and disparate effects of rural hospital closures on acute care access. Dr. Blaney holds a PhD degree in geography from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a Master of Arts in Social Sciences from the University of Chicago and a Bachelor of Arts in History from the University of California, Berkeley. I think such a diverse and unique educational background is a valuable asset for any scholars who study complex issues such as health in inequities. I've been very much looking forward to this talk today, and I can't wait to hear more about Dr. Planey's research. Dr. Planey, please take it away. Well, thank you so much for that um, lovely introduction. It was more detailed than I thought. Um, but thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. So um, first I'll say that I'm kind of at the beginning stages of thinking through how as a geographer I can truly apply intersectionality in my own work, especially in my work looking at health and healthcare inequities. Uh, so no need to go over there, but generally my work does concern the intersection of health and healthcare inequities in place. And I am particularly interested in measuring the cost of accessing healthcare. Um, so I've just started a uh, National Cancer Institute funded project looking at, for example, um, cancer-related financial toxicity, and to put, put attention to travel burdens and other non-financial costs of care, and uh, how it affects um, health-related quality of life among rural dwelling cancer patients here in North Carolina. Uh, content and methods, um, I'm interested in health workforce issues, uh, so you know, and one question would be where, like, where do healthcare workers work and why? And also, where the downstream impact of those their, their location decisions? Um, but also thinking about how healthcare policies can shape those decisions. Um, I'm also interested in equity and spatial access to care, thinking through access as a process and not just an outcome. Um, so I'm not. I don't need to go too all, all too much into the rest of this, but. Generally, and this is mostly for a non-geography audience, but um, I do generally specialize in modeling with spatially referenced data that violence 
violate the assumption of independence. Uh, trying to do that by matching, by also pairing method with theory. Um, and so it's, it's not just, oh, do the data match this approach, but more so does the research question match, like does the research question match the theory, match the method, match the data, all of it all at once. Um, and so this is a figure that my uh, PhD advisor, Sharon McLaughlin, created and used to first teaching. And it's been pretty much fundamental for my own work. Um, so thinking if health and medical geography, um, there's a strong emphasis on relational perspectives. And so thinking about the relationship between uh, places, context, but also thinking about the relationship between people and the health of people in those, in those places that are the context of their daily living. Uh, and so that one way we can get it into that, and then this is a particular strength in your department, I think, mobility, um, both behaviors, perceptions of places, experiences of places, um, all at the intersection of these individual and social differences. Um, and on another level, you could also account for ecological, historical, political, economic processes and policies that shape places and shape outcomes in places but also past dependencies in social and health policies that um, shape the environments that we live, work, and play in. Um, and another, this is something I developed specifically for public health audiences, but I do think it's relevant in general. But um, in terms of scale, it's like scale is a fundamental concept for us geographers, but it's something that I find I have introduced when I'm talking beyond the field of geography. And so a lot of time in health, at a health research space, a lot of times people are talking about social determinants of health, but they're not necessarily clarifying like the scale of analysis when they are talking about social determinants of health. Um, and then one of the, uh, my favorite example to give is at racial health inequities or racial health disparities. A lot of people talk about social determinants of health, but there are fewer people talk about these fundamental causes of the inequitable outcome. Um, fundamental causes are defined as the underlying social patterning of resources and hazards that drive health inequities. And they also underlie inequities in healthcare access. Um, and the fundamental cause, for example, would be structural racism. Um, but down far, far downstream, um, we have these concepts of social needs and social risk, which are often collapsed into the determinants of health. But typically, social needs and social risk are actually understood to be individual level factors. And they're usually addressed, identified and addressed at the level of the individual in the specific context of, of like a clinical context. So this is usually where healthcare systems intervene. Uh, and, but a lot of times these healthcare systems and insurance company led interventions are, are collapsed with interventions to address the social determinants of health, but they're not at all the same. Um, and so the guiding question for my work these days, it has been, um, so there's a quote in uh, one of my favorite books, Fragmented Democracy, Medicaid, Federalism, and Unequal Politics. And uh, it's on page 11 in the intro. When those most affected by a policy are also marginal in the polity, it is worth stopping to think about how policy and polity interact. And so then the second quote that I that have got me thinking as well was a quote from a 1974 article, and it's actually the title. Um, and this was in the middle of a in, in the middle of a series of debates about relevance in geography. And the title and the question that Carvey posed, and it really is also the title of the article, was what kind of geography for what kind of public policy? And um, and I would say in the past 30, even 40 years, the neoliberal experimental turn in US policy making has exacted a tax on the most impoverished. And as such, um, in more recent years, we've also seen a growing body work on 
uh, administrative burden or an onerous burden placed on people or communities in greatest need of the benefits that are promised or that come with certain social and health policies. Um, so for example, um, administrative burdens associated with like, accessing health care um, and particularly increase the likelihood of foregone care among Black and disabled patients in the US. Um, also, amid the pandemic, um, the several states, and I believe Ohio is one of them, uh, have been required have been requiring in-person appointments to maintain and continue eligibility for nutrition programs such as um, women and infant and children. Um, and as a result, there's been a drop in enrollment in these programs because of the burden that um, in-person appointments do pose, um, especially in terms of like the spatial uh, placement of these in-person these offices, um, also lack of childcare, um, also lack of paid leave. So it makes that all of that makes it difficult to go in in person to fill out the paperwork to maintain eligibility for any this nutrition um, in terms of Medicaid, which covers um, low income and um, disabled people, eligible disabled people in the country, this country. Um, uh, after the after Affordable Care Act, uh, states began adding work requirements to Medicaid. Um, in some states, uh, beneficiaries are required to prove that they have uh, engaged in at least 40 hours of active job searching to maintain eligibility for Medicaid. Um, and in another one, in terms of med uh, the COVID pandemic, um, cuts to unemployment benefits that were designed to ostensibly induce uh, worker re-entry into the workforce. Um, those have actually not delivered on the promises or the uh, touted benefits of increasing uh, re-entry into workforce. Uh, instead, they've actually uh, contributed to the impoverishment of people who have experienced pandemic job losses. Um, and so to take, uh, that takes us into intersectionality. What is intersectionality? How do we operationalize it? Um, I think the, probably the, the clearest quote, the clearest definition um, in the more recent literature, it comes from Patricia Hill Collins, uh, who also coined the term. Uh, when, well, no, she didn't coin the term, but she developed but more fully fleshed out the concept. The term intersectionality references the critical insight that race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, nation, ability, and age operate not as unitary, uh, mutually exclusive identities, but as reciprocally constructing con phenom phenomena that in turn shape complex social inequalities. Um, and that takes us to what intersectionality is not. Intersectionality is not additive. Uh, for us quantitative researchers, intersectionality cannot be reduced down to inter interaction terms. And nor can intersectionality be conceptually co collapsed with the concept of syndemics. Um, syndemics, I think, is more, we can think of it as more a, it's not quite a framework, but it's more so an approach that attempts to say, an approach, a conceptual approach that attempts to say, oh, look, all these inequalities at these intersections. Uh, occur at the same time and they're all bad, but it, it doesn't necessarily get at why these, uh, these inequalities are pr particularly pronounced for the most marginalized groups, the most marginalized communities in our society. I see a red chat. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay. And um, it's also, as we engage with this literature, it's really important to be attentive to the historical lineage um, of the framework of these, this, these theories that we're engaging, especially with intersectionality. Um, intersectionality it didn't spring fully formed in the 1980s. It 
what this is we're talking about over a hundred years of social theory that's arisen from social movement from and so so much of what we the historical insights that we draw upon as we conceptualize intersectionality so we can date those back to Harriet Tubman so Jonah Truth Anna Julia Cooper, Francis E. Harper, e. W. Harper, I. W. Wells, um, so many uh, black black women, black folks who um, were organizers, activists, advocates, um, who specifically addressed material conditions in black communities at the intersections of gender, class, disability status, and so forth. Um, and for on in terms of intersectionality for quantitative research, um, this quote from Bauer 2014 stands out to me um, that without an emphasis on intervenable processes or policies, um, a quantitative intersectionality focused purely on intersectional identities of position runs the risk of continuing to reinforce the intractability of inequity. And that gets at an earlier point I made um, that so much of what we're focused on in health research is downstream of the root causes. And so in that way, we're not fully identifying the problem. Um, let's see. Okay. And so then that takes us back to what intersectionality is not. Um, so I've noticed that, in the, and I'm, I'm sure this is a tendency that predates the past few years, but I've noticed that in more recent engagement with intersectionality, there is this tendency to collapse intersectionality with identity. But I do think we need to clarify that identity is not the same as positionality, um, nor is it the same as structural position nor is it the same as um, the social political ideology that a person or an individual is about to. Um, so it's really important to understand that intersectionality is not reducible to identity, but it, but it refers specifically to overlapping, intersecting, and reinforcing systems of oppression and their effects across the axes of political, politicized social difference. Um, and so, and I noticed, so, so there, you'll see a lot of more contemporary definitions that, that attempt to define intersectionality, that name identity. But um, we have to understand that social identity, that our, our identities are, they don't spring forth out of the air, right? They're reflective of so, so, you know, structural social stratification in our society. Um, and the, the subject positions that are arise from how we're racialized, um, how we're gendered, and all these other socially constructed um, categories that we're placed into. And also, and in terms of not only the categories, but also the material consequences of those categories in a society that's structured um, to benefit a few at the cost of many. Okay, so intersectionality in my own work. Um, so my, this current project I'll be uh, presenting from um, addresses downstream effects of health policies, um, health care policies. Uh, so for example, rural hospital closures and their effect on access to care in rural communities with attention to inequities at the axes of race, ethnicity, class, social economic status, which are not the same thing, but I'll just say social, social economic status and disability. Um, and so there's a couple of challenges there where in the health research space, rural is often shorthand for white, while urban is often shorthand for black. And this is true when you look in the literature on urban studies or urban geography, but it's not just specific to health care, health care geography, health geography or public health. Um, and so it's important also to challenge this dichotomy and attend to the racialized and class inequities within the category, within and without these categories of rural urban, uh, but with also with attention to the structural and spatial arrangements in healthcare here in the US. Um, and another challenge is measurement. Um, 
how do we measure short-term return rate of health? Um, and how we measure short-term return rate of health is actually subject to priorities of institutions that produce those data, but also may also have a hand in producing the inequitable outcomes that they measure. Um, and so and with that, it's important to remember that measurement is never outside the power. And um, also scale, scale of analysis matters. And so much of research, even though, uh, I like especially now that I'm in the public health space, even though the idea is that, oh, I study public health, population health, so much of the analysis is at the individual level. And so much of it tends to blame individuals for the structural inequities. Um, and so the, I want I want to shy away from that. And so, but yes, like individual level analyses matter to a degree, but they're not. They don't generate the insights we need to address structural problems, not by themselves. An example of this is uh, the CDC Social Vulnerability Index um, in terms of how the measurement of what we call social determinants of health is political. And um, this index, this is, uh, so here I produced the uh, local indicator to facial autocorrelation for the county level um, composite measure from the SBI data set. Uh, we can see that, that, so red is high, high clusters. Uh, the dark blue is low, low clusters. The light blue is low, high clusters. And the pink, pink color is the high, low cluster. Um, so much of the U.S. would be considered like a high, high cluster um, outside of the non-significant non -significant counties. So here, and I want to, there's one point I wanted to make about this data set is that they actually treat um, speaking a language other than English as a disadvantage. Instead of addressing how um, enforcing English as a primary language um, not having uh, language services available in healthcare context or in social, like, you know, uh, social work or uh, public, you know, in terms of also in the, you know, administrative offices that are ostensibly provide public services. Not having language services for people who do, whose language is, first language is not English. That, that is what produces the disadvantage, not them speaking a language other than English. Uh, and then more challenges in terms of specifically within uh, health services research. Um, and a lot of this gets at scale um, in terms of population, how you define population, um, but also in terms of coming from the perspective of health services research, where the focus is typically health systems, health care systems. There's actually a, a fundamental misalignment between how health systems and the health and healthcare insur healthcare insurance providers define uh, population versus how public health researchers and practitioners define population. Um, so health systems and insurers generally define the population as those, that group, that um, the group of patients who are currently insured within the networks that are served by that particular health system or health facility. Whereas public health, Practitioners and researchers have a more um, expansive definition of population that includes just people who live in a given place that is served by a, a set of services. Um, and so there's, it's a, it's a, it's a, so it's not, it's, it's a different spatial boundary, but also temporal boundary because health systems and insurers define their population in time bound, in a time bound sense in terms of people who are insured within this fiscal year. And so the, like if they're defining, if they're de, uh, designing and implementing population health med, uh, sort of interventions, they're typically only intervening on for patients who are insured, who are within their network to use healthcare services within their facilities in that given year. And, and because of there's so much churn or turnover and how, um, insurance coverage, that means that there's actually very little incentive for them to design anything longer term than that one, that one fiscal year. 
um, in terms of profound inequity, um, thinking about facial and facial relationships that underlie healthcare resource allocation and access, but thinking about the inequity formed by rural residents, um, racial and ethnic minorities who experience longer travel times to access care in both urban and rural contexts. And as I think I, I, I accidentally made this point twice, but misalignment and the, the scale is a problem definition and intervention, which takes us back to the scalar distinction between fundamental quality, social determinants of health, and social risk and social needs. Um, and so that takes us to structural racism. What is it? Um, I think one of my, this is my favorite definition when I teach, but um, the macro level systems, social forces, institutions, ideologies, and processes, and that includes policies that interact with one another to generate and reinforce inequalities among racial and ethnic groups. Um, some examples, um, I'm sure some of this is familiar to many of you, but um, yeah, this was a story in August 2020 covering um, redlining and green space, um, where a study, I think out of UVA, found that formerly redlined areas have less tree cover and more impervious uh, surfaces, paved impervious surfaces that radiate heat, absorb, absorb and radiate heat. Um, which cumulatively means that these are these formerly redlined areas also have higher average summer temperatures, which increases risk of uh, conditions like heat stroke, asthma attacks, um, and there's a couple of other things. Um, also, kidney disease has long term consequences for um, kidney health in communities of color, especially Black and Latino communities, especially. And so this is an example of the long arm of structural racism and how we, those structural racism, even though the policies that there are you no know, policies and categories and, and, and how, even though they may have been created and enacted years ago, there's a past dependency where they continue the, the uh, influence on the lived environment. So like these red line communities are also more likely to be disinvested, less likely to have infrastructure uh, maintenance and improvements, um, less likely to have green space. And that has long-term uh, consequences for the health of the communities of, of the people who live there. Another example, and this kind of ties back to the asthma, right? Um, this is a, a neighborhood that's in the shadows of Giants Hopkins Hospital. Um, and this actually, I think, illustrates the point about the misalignment in terms of scale um, and also policy. Uh, so, nonprofit, oh, sorry, so non public hospitals in the US are eligible for community benefit incentives to cover um, healthcare services for, in the healthcare services in the emergency department for under uninsured and underinsured patients who need care. And this was an incentive that was introduced to reduce the uh, frequency of private hospitals or non-public hospitals turning away low-income and underinsured patients or diverting them to public hospitals. Um, however, there was a per it actually is a, a perverse incentive where these health systems, these um, non-public private health systems, have no, they're incentivized to provide emergency care, but they're not incentivized to provide preventive care which is actually quite much, uh, emergency care is actually much, much more expensive than preventive care. And so they're effectively benefiting or profiting from lack of access in this, um, for example, John Totten, they're, they're actually effectively benefiting from both not only lack of access to preventive care, but the enduring um, health inequities born of these neighborhood and uh, disinvestment in their neighborhood. So here in this neighborhood, um, they no longer have um, sanitation. Uh, but, like, so garbage pickup, um, and, this, and the, we also have older housing stock in this area. So there's uh, quite a lot of rodents, cockroaches, uh, mold, and all of that adds up to greater risk of asthma attacks. And uh, so even here, um, yes, 
they need preventive care, but they all these are also uh, this is also a community that needs better health. Like this, this is where we need to intervene to address the social and structural determinants of health, like housing and uh, infrastructure and uh, community sanitation. And uh, more context on racial segregation in Baltimore. Uh, you can see why it's called the Black Butterfly. Um, and so extending that thought to segregation delineates resource allocation and allocation of hazard and risk. Uh, so thinking about investment and in infrastructure, so state plumbing, housing quality, education, so funding, especially with funding of education uh, based on property value, that reinforces inequity. So that, that means like poor facilities and communities of color may be less likely to be, uh, to have uh, you know, infrastructure uh, maintenance and updates. Uh, they may have far, much higher student to teacher ratio, um, school nurse look shortages, and, and that has consequences for the health of students and their families in, in these neighborhoods, right? And in terms of healthcare, um, prior research has also shown that segregated communities with high share of Black residents have fewer healthcare providers and frequently longer travel distances to care. Um, and also environmental racism, and that's another downstream impact of policies or even failure to implement policies to redress these environmental injustices. So for example, um, there was a 2015 EPA report that showed that ground fields um, are disproportionate. I mean, we already know, right? These um, formerly polluted industrial sites, um, about two, three, four, three quarters of public housing in the US is within one mile of a brownfield site. Um, and also thinking about uh, environmental site, like uh, polluting site placements or even like landfills too. Uh, plumbing poverty is another dimension um, here in the US. About um, half a million households or about 1.5 million people lack plumbing or sewage systems in 2016. And these households were disproportionately American Indian, and Black and Hispanic. Um, and uh, and this, was, this is actually axis of race, ethnicity, and class, um, where we see Black, Hispanic, and American Indian households, um, especially low-income households, are more likely to lack plumbing. And, uh, and so this, just kind of bringing this all together, we can, so we can think about it logically. If space is racialized, then so is time. Um, and so that brings us to thinking about time as a social determinant of health. Um, and so thinking about, thinking relationally about time as a resource, um, time uh, and also the implication, the downstream implication for racial uh, health inequities uh, and also racial inequities in healthcare. Um, so that takes us a less examined facet um, uh, in research on health outcomes and social determinants of health is time. Um, and uh, policy evaluation work that emphasis is frequently on whether an implemented policy achieved the stated aims or whether there are disparate impacts. But a lot less examined is the time burden associated with our social policies and programs. Um, and so like the administrative burdens that I uh, alluded to earlier, but also the cost that they impose on the people who can least support them. Um, and so these inequities, and I would say that they are, arise from these pre-existing, spatially uneven distributions of resources like healthcare, social services, affordable housing, and jobs. So for example, here in the US, um, nearly 110,000 disabled people, about 1.2% of applicants died prior to receiving the final decision about their appeal for social security insurance. Um, and that was between 2008 and 2019. Um, and there was similar statistics for the UK, actually. Um, and so with social security insurance, um, the, the de facto policy is to reject the first application. And the successful applicants are typically those who can hire a lawyer uh, and take the agency to court, basically, to, to um, appeal that rejection. So we had this system that is basically weeding out the people who had the greatest, greatest need. 
Um, and that actually another way of think about it, thinking about it is uh, is weeding out the people who have the least time, at least not only money but time. So why time? Time is a social determinant. Um, we can think of time as a resource that is socially patterned. Um, we can think of the patterning of time availability as fundamentally shaped by the spatial allocation of key resources, including jobs and healthcare. Um, in addition, so for example, for communities of color, um, in addition to travel longer wait time for needed healthcare, Black and Latino people especially experience um, longer travel distances to needed care. Um, and overall, people of color in the U.S. experience high degrees of time scarcity that's attributable in part, in part to disproportionate occupational sorting into precarious jobs without paid sick leave, longer work commutes born of a spatial mismatch between where they live and where they work. Um, and in, in prior work, um, including some work that I've done, we see that long commutes force a trade-off between wages, commute times, and housing affordability. And um, in the context of higher disease, uh, chronic disease prevalence in Black and Latino communities, time scarcity is also associated with greater difficulty in chronic disease management that the site modification. Um, and one underlying cause could uh, is, some, is potentially what's called supermarket re uh, redlining, where grocers followed white consumers to the suburbs amid, amid white flight. And so when we're talking about time as a social determinant of health, when we're talking about time as socially patterned, um, what do we measure? Uh, so we can measure the spatially uneven and racially disparate distribution of harmful exposure, for example, chronic stress in segregated neighborhoods or exposure burn of environmental racism, and also the downstream inequitable, inequitable and downstream effects of those, that spatially uneven distribution, right? Um, we can also measure time use. So thinking about time cost of continuing to work, access to healthcare, um, taking your child to childcare, thinking about, all the, thinking about it in a more cumulative sense and not just like one time, uh, not, not, not just in a, like an episodic sense, I guess. We can also think of wages. Every time we're talking about wages, we're talking about time. Um, we can think about wages also in, term, in a relational sense in terms of the trade-off with commute times and housing costs. Um, so in prior work, we've seen that disabled women of color and especially Black women face the most severe trade-off between wages and commute time. Um, and that's part of a broader literature on spatial mismatch that jointly considers time costs with social and monetary costs that are born of the allocation of resources that favors white and wealthy people in segregated social space. Um, in terms of implications for healthcare inequities, um, at the intersection of urban and rural, we can think of um, in terms of the inequity borne by rural residents, where travel time to care is actually a key barrier to healthcare utilization that affects not only the frequency, timing, and cost of healthcare, healthcare use or hospital visit, um, it also potentially affects healthcare outcomes. Um, so for example, what we see in the literature is that longer travel times to access healthcare um, have long-term downstream uh, implications for patients, including increased risk of hospitalization for ambulatory care sensitive conditions, um, Ambulatory care consistent conditions are conditions that are preventable and manageable uh, with the proper timely and uh, effective use of preventive care. Uh, also longer ambulance time and travel time and worse survival rates for emergent conditions. Um, low, lower rates of post hospitalization follow up care and higher rates of emergency department use. And in terms in the in terms of cancer outcomes, uh, delayed diagnoses and worse severity severity of uh, their condition at, at and after diagnosis. Um, in terms of in the context of this current pandemic, um, what we're seeing too, and we're thinking so this is extending our thinking about time scarcity, right? The least vaccinated groups persistently have been working age adults who work 
low wage job. And that's not including children who are in, in, in well, who are largely ineligible until uh, up until the last couple of days for the vaccine. Um, and so this this is particularly acute for Black and Latinx workers. And if you're looking at data, disaggregated data in California, you can also see uh, Southeast Asian workers are disproportionately affected as well, um, where they're disproportionately infected and dying uh, because they don't, you know, they're less likely to have the option to work remotely. Um, and also lack of paid sick leave is one of the most commonly cited barriers to receiving the COVID vaccine among un un unvaccinated workers who want to get the vaccine. So uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna go over a couple of studies and that just kind of illustrate my thinking about how to map intersectionality with spatial methods um, as I study health and health healthcare inequities. And so this first one is for my dissertation, looking at access to healing and balance disorder treatment. Um, and so in this context, um, a little bit of background, um, access to healing and healing balance disorder treatment is highly unequal. Um, as the US population ages, um, healing and balance disorder prevalence is expected to rise. Um, in the past, and so in the next nine years actually, it's projected that the spirit of people with hearing loss will increase 20%. Uh, meanwhile, we have growing shortages of providers. Oh, oh you guys can see better tech. This is better tech. Um, <laughs> okay, and so meanwhile, we're seeing a growing shortage of providers, so audiologists, due to the triplet trend of attrition, uh, clinical program closure, and falling enrollment in the uh, clinical audiology program. Um, access to these services is also constrained by healthcare policies that preclude coverage of audiology services beyond physician referred assessment. And this is specific to Medicare and Medicaid. And what this means is that older adults with hearing loss have higher out of pocket costs. Let's see. I'm going to the mouse. Um, in terms of spatializing geographies of care, um, I, my approach is to think of healthcare geographies as also healthcare policy landscapes. Um, and so this study examines spatial accessibility within the hierarchy of care. So from primary care up to specialist care, uh, to tertiary specialist care. And in the US, Medicare and Medicaid do not reimburse audiologist services beyond physician referred assessment in support of a medical diagnosis. Um, and so, so what we see are racial, ethnic, and class disparities in hearing healthcare access we use. Um, so typically when you're looking, when you, among Medicare beneficiaries who have the hearing loss diagnosed and treated, they're disproportionately high income and white. Um, and older adults who, um, and also what we see is that um, black older adults are maybe more, they're actually more likely to have their hearing loss screen, hearing screened, and that's typically through state Medicaid programs, but they're less likely to have their hearing loss treated. Um, and Medicaid uh, coverage is actually negative. It's, it's kind of a mixed picture here because, well, what it is is that each state Medicaid program elects differently to cover services that are beyond uh, medical, like so audiologists are not considered medical providers, so their services are not considered essential unless the med state Medicaid programs choose to cover those services. And, and it currently, that's about 17 states that cover those services for adult beneficiaries. And so there's a mixed picture in terms of whether Medicare, Medicaid coverage um, uh, improved access to audiologist services. Um, so my first dissertation paper we saw, I found that um, in the absence of uh, comprehensive coverage of their services, audiologists tend to locate in high income counties with younger populations and lower proportions of older adults reporting difficulty hearing. And so after doing this analysis at the county level, I wanted to um, examine whether these disparities are mirrored at a more, at a finer scale, so at the census tract level. And so then um, I decided to focus on the Chicago metro region because that's where 
I, I, you know, I'd lived and worked. Um, and I wanted to look at whether, one, do audiologists and co-locate with the physicians who refer patients to them? And so then I, I look specifically at providers who take Medicare. And that simplified analysis because uh, patients, so the, there's one challenge here where when you're looking at healthcare use, healthcare access, um, it's the network so so sliced up between different health insurance uh, health insurance network, uh, and so that so that's why I restricted this analysis to providers who accept Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and so then I looked at whether audiologists who take Medicare and Medicaid co-locate with the referring primary care physicians who also take Medicare and Medicaid. And I wanted to, to understand whether this co-location re, uh, reflects healthcare policies and health insurance regulations that uh, restrict the reimbursement of audiologist services to those that are uh, referred by physicians in the point of medical diagnosis. And then um, the second research question was, um, whether this co-location of audiologists with referring primary care physicians exacerbates social, economic, and racial inequalities in access to audiologist services. And so again, the study area was the Chicago metro region, um, 11 count the, the 10 county, 10 county region. Um, this area, this region is uh, home to about 61% of the state's population, uh, but nearly 82% of audiologists in the state. So here we already see like a pretty clear urban, rural urban um, disparity in the availability of, of, of these services, where there, again, there is a, this, a strong urban bias in the location of these providers. Um, data, um, to, so I got the, the list of providers from the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, the demographic data from the, the U.S. Census Bureau uh, network data set for the network uh, distance population from the Illinois Department of Transportation. Um, methods, I, just, I paired a uh, spatial cluster analysis with spatial regression model. Um, and so the first research question, whether um, audiologists co-located with primary physicians, here I applied spatial cluster analysis. So here's a class L function. Uh, and so just, I'm just not gonna get too much into the method, but just to say, in terms of interpretation, if the curve is above the line that indicates spatial co-clustering uh, between two sets of, of locations. And in this case, these are provider locations or offices. Um, and what we see that across the study area, at all distances, audiologists uh, co-locate with referring primary care providers. So, so uh, the pool of primary care providers that might potentially refer patients to them. And then the second research question was whether the co-location of audiologists with primary care, uh, with primary care providers reinforces racial and class disparities in spatial access to care. And, so what we see is that, and uh, this, so I had to divide the study area into two, um, just for for multiple reasons. But because, um, so in the Chicago core, the, like the, the metro core of the Chicago metro region, um, we see that majority Black and Hispanic tracks had uh, longer travel distances to care. Um, and, uh, but we also saw that low travel distances were lowest in the tracks. Uh, and tracks with households that had lower rates of car ownership. And these are actually very walkable areas of the city that are quite affluent with um, median household incomes above 100,000. Uh, and they also have very, very good access to um, healthcare providers because they are, this, this is an area that's clustered around what's called the, the central business district that's colloquially called the loop. Um, and so this is also, uh, this is an area that has the medical corridor. So this, this is where we're seeing like this in, inequality that's reinforced um, where high income areas also have the best access to healthcare. Um, they also have the best access to um, public transit too. Um, in the uh, suburban areas of the Chicago metro region, we also found that um, Travel distances were, I also found that travel distances were greater for tracks with lower incomes. 
And so in, in a nutshell, um, what it found was that within a uh, segregated metro region, um, audiologist co-location with primary care physicians reinforces class, ethnic, and racial uh, racial class, racial and ethnic disparities in spatial access to care. Um, and I do like I do think that this kind of this is a nice expansion of studies of healthcare geography that incorporates healthcare policies that shape interprofessional practice and also addresses space potential inequities in spatial access that result from the, the sort of spatial allocation of healthcare resources. So the second project I wanted to, to go, go through, um, this is looking at acute care access in rural communities and also consequences for um, access to preventive, to pre preventive care and cancer screening among rural, patient, uh, rural residents. Um, so we're here, we're also addressing the context of rural hospital closures and their impact uh, or consequences for access to care. Uh, my co-authors, uh, Donald Plainey, who's an assistant, uh, a teaching assistant professor here at UNC in the Department of City and Regional Planning. Uh, Sandy Wong, uh, assistant professor at Florida State in Geography. Sarah McLafferty, uh, who is now a professor emeritus at University of Illinois. And Michelle Coe, uh, health services researcher at uh, UC Davis. So what we, and overall pattern in terms of rural hospitals, um, we're seeing a steady decline in the number of rural hospitals in the U.S., um, partly due to closures, partly due to mergers and acquisitions. Um, and so between 2005 and 2018, 155 rural hospitals closed their doors, either ceasing inpatient care or converting the rehab or long-term care facilities or shutting down altogether. Um, a majority of these closures, uh, about 63%, were in the U.S. South region, which has historically had poor health outcomes, lower rates, higher rates of insurance, um, and this is an area that encompasses what we call the Black Belt. So over 30 years, we've seen the rural hospital closures disproportionately affect the U.S. South region. Um, in between 1990 and 1999, we had 119 rural hospital closures, and of those, um, actually 49 were in the U.S. South region. Um, to, to between 2000 and 2019, 74 rural hospital closures, and of those, 32 were in the U.S. South region. And in the last decade, since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we've had 141 rural hospital closures, of which 94 were in the U.S. South region. Um, and there's, a, there's multiple facts and multiple reasons for these rural hospital closures, but um, basically in the 1990s, um, this was the, the downstream consequences of the shift to um, prospective payment system for hospitals, which prior to this, hospitals were paid ahead of time. So hospitals, uh, it, it fundamentally changed how hospitals handled their accounting. And it also um, signaled a shift toward outpatient care um, because this was also a time when um, healthcare policymakers emphasized reducing um, hospital, inpatient hospital services, uh, service use and reducing the uh, payment for inpatient services. Um, and so then there was just a push to move towards outpatient care provision, reduce hospital stay length, um, reduce hospital readmissions. And so what that had what that meant was that hospitals had to change their revenue sources. Um, but it was also a shock to the hospital finances. So this um, actually uh, prior to this period we also there was an unprecedented wave of rural hospital closures um, between 1985 and 2000. 1985 and 1990, sorry. Um, after 2010, the passage of the 2010 Affordable Care Act, um, we saw more closures, um, especially in states that did not expand Medicaid, and those are disproportionately in the U.S. South. So uh, let me get back on track, but the contemporary wave of rural hospital closures has had racially disparate impact. Uh, impact. Um, majority Black rural communities are at elevated risk, risk losing their 
elevated risk of losing their hospitals because their hospitals tend to be, have um, slimmer margins um, and less capital on hand. Let's see. Um, in terms of travel distances and times access to acute care, um, we, so what we did was we estimated travel uh, network travel distances, network travel time from each population weighted centroid for each rural each rural census tract across the U.S. South. Um, and our estimates actually were strikingly similar to estimates based on utilization or realized access. Uh, for example, the 2017 National Household Travel um, Survey, which is a survey of over 260,000. Uh, U.S. residents within 100, nearly 130,000 households. Um, and what we found was that for rural residents in U.S. South, the mean travel distance and uh, travel time to access the nearest and nearest acute hospital um, was about 15.9 miles or 22.6 minutes for the nearest hospital and 26.4 miles or 35.5 minutes um, for the, the next nearest hospital. And that was compared, that's compared with an overall mean of 35.4 minutes travel time for healthcare use among uh, NHTS respondents. So it's actually striking, strikingly similar to estimates based on utilization. Um, overall pattern, um, we see um, rural tracks that are within counties. Uh, so this is, this is just showing the distribution of rural tracks within counties with and without rural hospital closures. Um, and rural tracks uh, within counties that had closures were, these are also rural tracks that had higher shares of Black and Latino residents, and they're also more likely to be adjacent to metro areas. Um, we also saw, so in the past, past 10, 15 years, we've seen fewer closures in the most remote rural counties that also have higher shares of white residents. White residents. Um, in another study, I found that over the past 30 years, uh, rural hospital closures have had even more racially disparate impact. Where it's actually we're actually seeing the risk shift towards majority Black rural communities um, in the U.S. Um, and in terms of reality, travel distance and time to the nearest hospital and next nearest hospital generally distance to care increases with rurality, but these estimates, these um, averages match racial and ethnic disparities in access to acute hospitals. Um, and so in terms, and not only, so I, I didn't want to just focus on distance to the nearest hospital, distance to the next nearest hospital, but thinking also about additional distance to access to an alternative hospital. Um, so this is important because in health services research, um, a lot of the distance measurements that I use to evaluate the impact of closures are based on distance between facilities, but not population-based measures of distance. And so this is measuring just a, pop a population-based measure of distance or travel impedance or whatever term you want to use to access acute care. Uh, between the nearest hospital and the next nearest hospital. So the distance to the nearest alternate, alternate hospital. And what we found was that residents in about 57% of rural tracks in the U.S. South, about 10 million people, or 80% of rural residents, had to travel an additional 18, 15 minutes or more to access the next nearest hospital. And of those, over 2.5 million rural residents had to travel an additional 30 minutes or more to access the next nearest hospital. Uh, this one census tract uh, is kind of an outlier. Um, it's in Florida, uh, south, south, southern Florida. Uh, actually, it's the Florida Keys. Um, here is a map showing uh, network travel distance on the left and on the right, network travel time to the nearest hospital. Um, in terms of distance, the range was from, from about 0.2 miles to 47 uh, miles. And for travel time, the range is about, about less than a minute to 64 minutes travel time. And the 64 minutes travel time, that's a travel, that's the license is checked in Florida. Uh, across, so in 2018, across the rural U.S. South, residents in the majority Latinx tracks actually had the longest travel distances and travel times to access acute care. 
um, to the New York Rural Hospital compared to, to residents in majority black and majority white tracks. Um, and what we see too is that when you look at just the next nearest hospital or the closest alternative hospital, um, these, these racial and ethnic disparities become more pronounced. Uh, residents in majority black and majority Latinx travel uh, tracks, rural tracks, had the longest travel distances to the nearest alternate hospital compared with uh, residents in majority white tracks. And this isn't uh, despite the fact that majority white rural tracks are much more likely to be removed. So here is a different, uh, here's a map showing that the difference in network travel time between the nearest hospital and then the nearest alternative, alternative acute hospital across the rural US South. Oh, um, I'll get to that question after. Uh, so American Indian communities, I do, I did look at that and I'll, I'll get into that later. Okay. So here, um, in terms of additional distance to access the nearest alternative hospital, um, what we saw was that in 2018, as the track level proportion of Black residents increased, so did the additional travel time to access the nearest alternative acute hospital. Um, and the opposite pattern held for uh, white, the, for the, in terms of white share of population in rural tracks across the US South. And interestingly, additional travel time to the access the nearest alternative hospital was highest um, in rural tracks with a moderate share of Latinx residents. So th this is interesting too, because I saw a similar pattern when I looked at these kind of data over 30 years. Um, and for American Indian uh, uh, rural communities, so in terms of American Indian population share in rural communities in the US South, it's more of a mixed picture where um, communities with the, the and this, is, this reflects um, the fact that uh, communities with moderate and higher shares of American Indian population. So moderate, so I, moderate, low, moderate, high. I define that as low population is zero to 29%, moderate population 30 to 59%, and high population is 60 to 100%. And so communities uh, rural census tracks with um, low shares of American Indian populations had longer travel, additional travel distances to access an, um, an alternative hospital compared to um, rural census tracks with um, moderate and high shares of American Indian uh, population uh, residents. And that reflects in part the uh, benefit, the contribution of an Indian Health Services Hospital. Uh, here's the same data in table form, uh, just in place anyone wanted to see the spread. Um, and so we estimated, uh, so three level mixed effects, generalized linear, linear model to assess um, whether there are racial, ethnic, and class disparities in um, travel times to the nearest and next nearest hospital. So here's the model for the nearest hospital. What we found is that rural census tracts nested within rural communities, rural counties that had no closures, had short, shorter drive, driving times to access um, the nearest hospital. Uh, compared with hospitals in closure counties. So another way to put it is that hospitals, uh, sorry, rural census tract, residents in rural census tract within closure counties had longer distances to care. Um, we also found that tracts with higher median household incomes had longer driving times to access the near short-term short acute hospital. Um, but these are also communities with higher rates of car ownership too. Uh, tracks that are nested in more remote rural counties so it, um, had longer driving time to access the shortest near, uh, the nearest short-term acute care hospital. Not surprising there. Uh, we saw that in the descriptive statistics uh, for travel times and distances by rurality. And uh, at the state level, um, concentration of health insurance markets was negatively associated with travel time. And this is an interesting finding I don't really have an explanation for. Still working on that. So here's the model for um, next nearest hospital. So travel, travel time to next nearest hospital. There's a network travel time. Um, 
uh, so consistent with the descriptive statistics, um, we found that rural tracts with moderate and high share of Black residents had longer driving times to access the, ne the, the nearest alternative acute hospital. Um, and, and we also found, again, that median household income was positively associated with travel time. Um, and um, interestingly, um, median age was negatively associated with travel time to the nearest alternative hospital. And this is good um, because, because communities that are, you know, where we have higher shares of older people, these are communities with heavier health care needs. So it's good that they have better, have better access. And uh, more remote communities actually had shorter driving time to the nearest alternative hospital. And so this is a striking finding, but it also reflects the uh, investment that the federal government has made to improve access in the most remote rural communities. So key takeaways, um, racial disparities in rural tra uh, travel time acute care are more apparent when we account for travel time to the next nearest hospital. Um, and I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but in health services research, there are a lot, if the researchers incorporate, so health services research outside the medical geography, if the researchers incorporate travel times or, or driving time, travel, driving distances, they typically only do it for the nearest hospital. Um, so, but then, so in that way, they're not really getting at what we call, what we would call spatial accessibility. Um, and so, yes, these um, the, the disparities in travel time, travel distances uh, to acute care are, are most striking uh, when we examine distances to the nearest alternative hospital. Um, and again, federal policies and investments to improve access to acute care in the most remote rural communities. We can see that in the uh, descriptive statistics and the models. Um, and so here in this, in this follow-up, we looked in a follow-up analysis, we looked at um, HIPSA status, county HIPSA status. So health professional shortage areas as a federal de designation that's based on not only travel distance, but um, availability of providers. And I believe it also incorporates um, measures of need for services. So like age composition and health status of the population. Um, and so there's three uh, categories within HIPSA, like the HIPSA category. Um, there's counties that are not considered to be health professional shortage areas. Um, there's counties that are partial health professional shortage areas. And this category was actually tweaked in the 2000s. So if you were to compare like the 19, from 1989 to now, you'd have to be careful with those, uh, with those categories because around 2005, they changed how they define partial HIPSA. And um, there's also whole county prime, uh, HIPSA. And so here we specifically looked at primary care HIPSA. There's also dental HIPSA, uh, mental health HIPSA, um, but we, what we see is that um, overall travel times to access the nearest and next nearest hospital are highest for rural tracts that are located in counties classified as partial county primary care campuses. Um, and so that's a 23.8 minutes travel time to the nearest hospital, uh, 37 minutes travel time to the nearest alternative hospital. Um, and that's higher than even the uh, travel distance, travel time for census tract residents and census tract within whole county primary care HIPSA, which is so that's like uh, about two minutes longer for the nearest hospital and about almost two minutes longer for the next nearest hospital. And then I know, so what we, for this analysis, we actually looked at the association between um, distance to acute care um, or acute, acute hospitals and receipt of preventive care and cancer screening among rural dwelling adults. Um, in hospitals, so here in the context of healthcare uh, in the US and uh, rural US South, especially hospitals play an outsized role in the provision of preventive care. Um, because, well, there's generally a lower availability of healthcare providers, um, and those healthcare providers are much more likely to be affiliated with health system and work within hospitals. Um, and so rural residents are actually more reliant on hospitals for their prime, preventive primary care. Um, and so what we, this is why we looked at uh, 
distance is the uh, hospital um, here. And so what we see is that across the board that um, the share of rural dwelling adults who received routine uh, checkups in the past year and also by gender. So share of men uh, age 65 and over, share of women age 65 and over who received routine uh, preventive care in the prior year, and also share of um, older adults, a share of adults, rural dwelling adults who received colon cancer screening, colonoscopy, colon, um, um, and also received a cervical cancer screening. And I'm sorry, it's just blocking my view here. I can't move this other way. Oh, here we are. Uh, also, rural dwelling adults who is the share of adults who receive uh, cholesterol screening in the prior five years, and share of women who receive mammography or breast cancer screening. Generally, negatively, uh, there's also a general, generally a negative association as distance to the nearest alternative hospital increases. So what we see is like as distance to the nearest acute hospital increases the uh, the share of adults receiving preventive care and cancer screening declines. Um, we also see that um, Prescott County Texas across the board have lower rates of adults in tract, rural census tracts within uh, partial county hipsters um, across the board have lower rates of uh, preventive care receipt and cancer care screening. Um, and so I think, so basically the, the point is that um, here we see that distance to care, to, uh, travel impedance, uh, spatial inequities and spatial accessibility of care um, has, is consequential for the receipt of uh, timely uh, preventive care uh, screening uh, screening that can um, improve um, health population health outcomes. Um, and so the so overall contributions of these projects um, are measures of network travel distance and time to move beyond provider and facility counts, which are still the norm in health services research, um, far less so in health and medical geography. Um, and so we're, in another version of this project, we also measure changes in spatial, assess uh, spatial accessibility of hospital-based services after hospital closures. Um, so, but conceptually, this allows for border crossing in health services research. Um, much of health services research, actually, the analysis lim is limited to the county level, county scale. So it doesn't actually get at um, realized access for people who live within those counties, but maybe cross borders. Um, to access care. Uh, and that's especially important in rural contexts because over 50% of rural, uh, rural counties do not have hospitals. Um, but also, we also highlight within county variation in the effects of rural hospital closures. And I have a slide that shows that. And um, the focus on spatial accessibility is still fairly novel in health services research. Um, so the data from this study can actually be studied, uh, extended to study bypass behavior. So bypass is when patients do not use services at the nearest facility, the facility nearest them. Um, and there, that those pat that pat that bypass behavior is actually patterned by class, race, ethnicity, age, and also severity of their health conditions that are being treated. And also insurance type. So um, patients who have commercial insurance or private insurance coverage are more likely to bypass their local hospital um, and even more likely to use urban hospitals um, when they when they uh, seek out specialist care. So here's another uh, figure from a, an earlier version of this project where we measured um, changes in spatial access. So um, the red is um, places rural census checks that experience worsened access to acute care. And in blue are uh, rural census tracts that experience improved spatial access to care um, between 2007 and 2018 after accounting for rural hospital closures and mergers and acquisitions. Um, so that, I think, and so here is also getting at the within county variation in the effect. So here in my own county, this is a county that had two closures. Um, we see that census tracts within the, uh, so yellow is unchanged access 
So, but then the uh, county that had two closures, we see that there's actually differential impact on access to care uh, among re residents within those counties. And we also see uh, some potential spillover uh, in tracks that neighbor that county. So like in health services research, it's typical to just to say, oh, this county had a closure and these people were affected by that closure. But it doesn't account for the fact that over half of rural counties do not have hospitals. And so people, there is a lot of border crossing to access health care. Um, here's another example of Gibson County in Tennessee. And this one's I think of one of the better examples of like, um, within county how doing a heterogeneity and a differential impact of closure. Um, so in uh, Gibson County, which is here on the east or on the left, that uh, this is a county that had two closures. And, but you see in the northeast corner, sorry, northwest corner of the, of the county, uh, residents experience better access to care, um, probably due to a merger. Um, whereas the rest, residents in the remainder of the county experience worse access to care. Um, and uh, in the neighboring county, the, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but they had one closure. But we can also see differential impacts where the tracks near the hospital experience worse act, worsening access, but the, tra the tracks in the eastern half of the county, uh, residents experience improved or improved access to acute care hospitals. So that takes us back to this quote. When those most affected by a policy are also most marginal in the policy, it is worth stopping to think about how policy and policy interact. And so that takes me to the end of this talk. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but basically just thinking, I'm still thinking through how we in geography, especially in health and medical geography, can integrate the insights of intersectionality and how we study health and healthcare inequities or even facial inequities. Um, and so I do think there's a lot of ways direction, especially when it, you know, even in like mobility research, right? Um, we know that mobility is gendered, it's class, it's racialized, and it's reflective of mismatches between where we live and where we work, where we where we where our children go to school, where our children receive child care. And so it's like it, in that way it's gendered, it's racialized, it's class. Um, and so that's something that's often missed when we just aggregate averages without without attention to um, sort of the axes of social difference. Um, and uh, inequality, social inequality that shape access to opportunities, uh, proximity to uh, essential services and um, jobs. Um, so I thought there we can uh, hopefully, oh my God, it's really almost five o'clock. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Any questions? I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize it's such time. Thank you very much, Ariana. Very informative talk. Um, I really enjoy it. And we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. I invite everyone to turn on camera if, if you could and engage in the discussion. Um, our tradition is having students asking questions first and then everybody goes after that. Um, and Jocelyn has a question, so I think we can go with her question first. Have any of these studies examine how Native American communities are affected? Yes, um, I did address that shortly. Um, it's a mixed picture because um, American Indian community, uh, rural communities, I mean, well, American Indian, American Indian communities are, it's almost polar, where strongly rural or strongly urban, but the rural communities in particular um, are pretty well served by Indian Health Services Hospital. Um, and so that's why we saw that they actually had some of the shortest distances to access acute care services. Um, so, but I didn't include them uh, include that in the model because the share, the number of tracks that had a significant share of American Indian residents was actually quite small. So, thank you. Any other questions?
and maybe open for everyone. Max Martin has a question. Was there any usage of qualitative methods in support of this study? I may have just missed it, but I wanted to ask. That's the next step. Um, I would love to apply qualitative or mixed methods approaches in follow-ups. Um, looking at, so I would like to understand, better understand actual or real life action um, among rural dwelling, uh, you know, patients who use healthcare. Uh, so that is the next step, but no, not currently. Thanks. Oh yeah. Oh, so um, I didn't put it. I didn't include it in the output. But when I'm looking at uh, Medicare Medicaid expansion, um, I did find that overall states that expanded Medicaid had uh, residents, rural residents within states that expanded Medicaid had better spatial access to care. Um, but I do think there's some confounding there because the states that have expanded Medicaid are overwhelmingly much more urban than the states that have not expanded Medicaid. And so there might be, it might be that those states already had uh, short, residents in those states already had better spatial access to care um, because there was more proximity to urban centers or you know greater availability of healthcare in those states. Um, but I do think that, uh, in terms of expanding and ex expansion with Medicare and Medicaid and how that might imp impact the disparity, I, in the longer term, I think we're going to actually have to invest to increase health, the health workforce and build more hospitals um, because we've been steadily losing hospitals since actually since Medicare was implemented. Um, after Medicare, actually in the uh, 30 years after Medicare was implemented, we lost 99% of the hospitals that serve the majority of Black rural res Black residents in this country. Um, these are his hospitals that historically served Black communities. We've lost 99% of those since then. So another question from James. I used to work at a health uh, equity research center and we almost never published maps for fear of uh, re-stigmatizing communities and areas experiencing disadvantage. Do you have any general advice on the responsible use of maps to promote health equity? Just for yeah. those who can't see the chat. Yeah, I think but I generally don't map things like um, that you would call health behavior. Uh, but I do we think that because access to care or you know spatial access to care is a structural determinant of equity in health and health care, um, I feel a little less squeamish about publishing a map of distances to care versus a map of, oh, do you eat healthy vegetables? Because that doesn't get at the question, like when you map that, you're not addressing, do you have access to healthful, affordable foods? Um, whereas health, like mapping distance to care, it's much harder to blame the individual, blame individuals who are bearing the grant of those inequities or the inequities that arise from poor access to care. It's harder, at least for me. Um, so I think that as when, if we do publish maps that illustrate inequities or inequalities, um, we have to be mindful that how people interpret those maps is filtered through the lens of stigma. And so understanding the stigma, uh, the stigma is that kind of, I guess, are the lens through which people interpret health, like data about health outcomes. Um, then navigating that as you publish maps or as you publish like data visualizations in general. Um, I, I don't know easy answer there, I think. It's just, really knowing who your audience is and doing your best to address not only that audience, but other people who may be, uh, you know, who may be reading and interpreting your work. Especially in the area of public health policy. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Yeah. It's nice to see some familiar faces. If nobody has question, I have uh, one small question. I'm wondering if you recommend any possible policy interventions, maybe in the short term and some other in the long terms to address these issues. Yeah. Um, so this is, so we already had uh, federally qualified health centers, which are supposed to be within 10, mi 10 minutes or 10 miles of a, an existing hospital. Um, we have rural health clinics, um, but the thing is they largely, they largely provide outpatient services. Uh, but there's still continuing um, in a, sort of inequalities in terms of access to technologies. Uh, so like um, more technology intensive procedures like colonoscopy or um, mammography may be less available at these facilities, even though they, on paper, they expand access to care. Um, and so that like what we see in rural communities is that um, access to preventive care and primary care still relies on the availability of hospitals that we're using. And so I think we, we, in addition to improving access to primary or preventive care, um, you know, funneling money towards uh, physician practices, we need to, uh, we need a lot more investment to keep the hospitals that we already have viable, financially viable, so that they can continue to operate in communities that are already underserved. Um, not in the short term. In the longer term, we need a lot more investment in health workforce. Um, these are community, so what we're seeing too is that, um, um, that not only there are the economic impacts associated with these closures, but we're also seeing that um, the loss of healthcare workers precedes and um, follows these closures. So um, one, early to know that a hospital is closing is when they lose surgeons. But then when a, a community experiences hospital closures, they experience persistent um, reductions in health work, healthcare work, the healthcare workforce. Um, and so these communities, so not only do they lose access to acute hospital, but they lose access to primary care. Um, we see that among Medicare beneficiaries where um, use of primary care is fine, but use of emergency uh, department or emergency services increases because um, because their you know chronic conditions are unmanaged in the absence of primary care. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I for the last hour, I I don't know if anyone has question in the last minute, and if not, um, I like to thank you again, Ariana, for taking time speaking with us, and uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. Yeah, have a great weekend, all. Thank you.